Well, hello and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we are on episode three in our series of Hermeneutics 101. Why are we talking about Herman? Because he's a eudic. Oh, oh wait, I don't no. even know what the, That's I, don't, not true. I don't know what that is. But as we get going, we're going to talk today about the coherence principle and the integrity principle. And if you just fell asleep, I don't blame you. It's okay. But if you stick around, it'll actually be kind of cool and awesome to see how this all fits together. Our last episode, we talked about the Christological principle for interpreting and understanding scripture and also kind of shed a little bit of light or gave a little hint that this is bigger than scripture. What we're talking about here actually impacts a lot of our life and the world around us and how we see it. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more today, particularly by talking about the integrity principle and the coherence principle. But before we do that, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if something we said confuses you or you loved something we said or you hated something we said, We'd love to hear about it. Send an email to questions at crucialproductions.org. Head on over to our website, crucialproductions.org, and click the Ask a button at the top there and fill out the form to send us a question. Find us on social media. You can find Crucial Productions on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our Facebook group is called The Grok Moot. You can request to join that as well. And if you appreciate what we do here with Crucial Productions, with our podcast, Bible in Five, and the different things we got going on, after you've given to your church, consider supporting us and donating to us financially. Head over to crucialproductions.org slash give to do that. All right, Kevin, since you're literally the professor of <laughs> hermeneutics. Literally. Literally, like it's an actual official thing now. It is. Um, can you really quick tell us the integrity principle and the coherence principle, and then let's just get right into it. Okay, so... Remember that the, the overall principle for interpretation of Scripture, how to read the Bible, is really focused on Jesus. So the most important thing is that the entire Scriptures is focused on God's definitive action in Jesus Christ to save mankind. And this is how we're going to read the entire Scripture, how we're going to interpret the entire Scripture. The goal of reading Scripture is faith in Jesus Christ, the the reason we read scripture is because of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. And the reason scripture was given to us was that God wanted us to know about his love for us in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus and his action, his incarnation, his perfect life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his second coming really are the focus of scripture. So that's the first thing. Now, as we read it Christologically, we, we realize that the Bible is not just one text. It's not just one statement, you know, said a thousand times. There are actually different parts. Jesus loves parts. you. Right. Jesus loves you. Jesus, lo wait. Right. Hold it's on. not just said a thousand <laughs> different ways. It, it's actually full of stories. It's, it's full of poetry. It's full of um, historical accounts, narrative, genealogies. Um, there's some wisdom literature in there with proverbs and kind of wise sayings on how to live. There's philosophical treatises in there. There's um, there's letters with with some theology in them as well as some instruction on how to live out this theology. There's some of those letters have long philosophical treatises within them. Yes. <laughs> and and there's even a couple books that would be called apocalyptic books, which are kind of um, hard ah! hard to read and understand. So they're very they're I'm written with a lot of symbolism. I'm supposed to be scared when I hear apocalyptic. Yes, right. be scared. Okay. Be very scared. Yeah. And so what do we do when you sit down and say, okay, it's Christological, but there's all these different parts and different texts and different kinds of texts, and and if you just read the Bible, you, and it's going to be hard sometimes to figure out how it's Christological. So yeah. one of the things that people do is they say, oh, well, all that means is we can interpret the Bible however we want. We can just take whatever words we want from whatever passage and just kind of make them say what we want. And so I'm gonna say, well, the Bible is Christological, therefore I'm gonna take this word out of context and just make it mean whatever I want. Or I think the Bible is an instruction book for today and how I should live. So I'm gonna take whatever passage and just interpret it as though it's about my life. And, or you might have a theological agenda, like you wanna prove that we're saved by works. And so you're gonna go find in the Bible the places that talk about works and say, see, 
the Bible says works. <laughs> therefore, we're saved by works. And yep. James says it. James I mean, says it's it. Right therefore, there. it's true. Um, Ephesians two ten says it. Therefore, it's true. You know, yep. and those kinds of things. And and we're not denying that those passages are true. But what we're saying is within this Christological interpretation of Scripture, we also want to make sure we're reading the Bible with integrity, that we read the Bible as it's written. And and one of the most important things about the integrity principle is that Scripture has a plain and simple meaning. So mm-hmm. what that means is we're going, not going to read the Bible as though it's a bunch of code words that actually mean something else. <laughs> Which sounds funny when you say it, and yet we do it all, all the, the time. time. Yeah, we're always seeking, well, I can't, it, okay, yeah, it means that, but there's really something else that if I can just really get this treasure out of it, then it'll finally unlock what it actually means. And you just bypass the plain meaning entirely because you're digging for treasure. Right, and so what the first thing we want to do is we want to read the passages of Scripture with integrity, meaning they meant what they meant when the writers wrote them. So when Jeremiah is talking about Israel or Judah going into exile, he meant that. He actually, they actually meant went that. Into exile. And they actually went in exile. You know, in 586 and 601 and 598, they all these things actually happen. When Jeremiah says, don't go make a, cre- a treaty with Egypt, they did. And they actually made a treaty with Egypt. And he said, don't do I that. I thought you said tree. Don't, don't go make, make a tree, a tree with Egypt. It's don't like, do that either. Well, I don't know where that text is. See, that's that Peter making like stuff up. Yeah, it sounds like a reference to an idol. <laughs> yeah, something. Okay, so oh, now I'm going to go find references to idols and trees. And there's the Sylvan God, which is Silas. I named my son Silas. What have I done? Exactly. And see, and look see, at that's just like that. <laughs> and that's ignoring the integrity of Scripture. That's ignoring the plain meaning of Scripture when you do something like that. So one of the things we want to do is, as you're reading the Bible, read it with the the notion that these texts are actually quite simple. They're not written in code. They're not written in some kind of mystical language that normal humans can't understand. So it's the easiest way to think about it is that anybody who understands how to read English could open your Bible and read it and understand what it's saying. They might not understand the theological implications, might not understand the teachings of it, but they can understand the words and the story. So they could read the story of King David and they would walk away saying, well, there was a king in this place called Jerusalem who did certain things, right? Yeah. That's that's plain. And that's reading the Bible with integrity. We're not going to read the, the story of David and say, well, this is actually code for uh, the who president are the of the United States. And- Right. Who are the Goliaths in your life? Right. Heaven, so then all of a sudden you get these interpretations where go find your five stones. Yeah. Which aren't actually stones. Right. And that st- stands in your for life something else. Ref- yeah. <laughs> and and that's and that's kind of the 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 main way this principle falls apart is when we start reading the Bible, it's actually just a bunch of um, symbols that are actually properly interpreted in my life. And, and that's not really reading the Bible with integrity, meaning, I'm not questioning your integrity, I'm saying it's not reading <laughs> the text as though the, the words themselves actually mean something in their original setting. Could so, you say that treating the text as if it has integrity? Yeah, it, originally. Yeah, like, like it, yeah. When it was written, people read it and they understood it. Yeah. They didn't have to transport to 2020 and say, oh, this is about the coronavirus, <laughs> right? It, it oh, I haven't meant... seen that one. Wait, yeah, I guess I, I have seen that yeah, one around. It's, it's around. Yeah, uh, this... I mean, I'm on Facebook enough. I'm sure I've seen that one in Revelation somewhere. Exactly. So what we want to do is we're going to read the Bible with this idea that, that Scripture means what it says. It, it's simple. It has mean the words mean what normal words would normally mean. So when it says in the Gospels, Jesus got into a boat, that doesn't mean he walked around heaven and zapped the demons. It means he got (laughs) into a boat. And boat means 
exactly what you think a boat is something that we have made to float on water that people can go into and in this case uh, we know the context is on the sea of galilee uh, the people are fishermen so it's probably a fishing boat but that's the point you can think of the word boat picture it had a boat and that's what scripture mm-hmm. means yep it, it doesn't mean something entirely different so that's kind of the integrity idea is that we're going to read scripture believing that the words that god inspired to communicate to us are words that we can understand okay so I, I so look. right away you think of something like the book of genesis and it says god created the world and there is evening and there is morning the first day so we don't read that text and say oh that's all code for something else yeah <laughs> we actually read it and we think okay i know what morning is i know what evening is and i know what day is and it's it makes sense to read it as morning and evening and day as things that we can identify with morning and evening and day. So that now, I would say the natural reading of the text is that it means morning when the sun comes up, evening when the sun goes down, and day as the cycle of morning and evening. Now, the, this is a good example to, to bring up this idea that we've talked about before, how you can't take a modern definition of a word and then apply it to scripture. So, for example, right now I'm seeing a, a discussion on my Facebook wall, not my wall, but on my Facebook feed about slavery and mm-hmm. taking the American version of slavery and all that it's defined and everything that was and saying that's exactly what was happening in scripture. Anytime you see the word slave, it means the exact same thing. Okay, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but we need to be very careful that we're not taking our modern current definition and then forcing scripture to mean the same thing. We've talked about this when we say God is love, who actually defines what love is. So in this case, with the integrity principle, Kevin, when we talk about day, I do hear discussions on this where, well, you know, back in the ancient times, they never would have conceived of day as a 24-hour thing. That's a modern convention. So scholars are kind of trying to take the opposite approach and well actually trying to say look you can't take today's modern definition and apply it to scripture and and that's actually very true um yeah so when when paul says speak to one another in hymns and songs and spiritual songs that doesn't mean that you can open your lutheran hymnal and find the section called spiritual songs and and find this the section called hymns and say this is what paul's referring to um, we know that the hymnody that we have today, four-part harmony, German chorale setting, all those kind of things, didn't exist in Paul's day, right? Yeah. So you can't say he means to sing a mighty fortress. That's not what he's talking about. But he is talking about Christians singing songs, okay? And we, and we know, know what songs are. that they sang songs. <laughs> and we know songs yeah. involve music and singing, and, and he's talking to the congregation singing together. So we know we have congregational singing. And so we can, with, with very good integrity and very easily say, Paul encourages the church to sing songs. Now you're right. It's not gonna be specifically the song that I'm singing today in my church, right? He's right. not talking about, I am Jesus' little lamb you know, that, that specific <laughs> hymn. But we would say this hymn that we call a hymn today would fit into Paul's teaching in Colossians and Ephesians to sing songs with one another in worship to God. And so that would work. And so when you say the ancients did not have a 24-hour day, in some ways that's true. 24 hours was not what they conceived of as a passage of time. But they did measure a day by the sun going up and down. Yeah. which is the exact same thing we do. Now, they didn't define it exactly as we define it. If you think of, they, they didn't break think it up of John 11, okay, John 11, Jesus says there are 12 hours in a day. Well, we know scientifically that actually at that time in that place, days measured from about nine hours and 48 minutes of daylight to 14 hours and 18 minutes of daylight, about, right? I'm sorry, 14 hours and 12 minutes of daylight, about. Not exactly okay. 12 hours every day. But I what didn't Jesus know that, is saying, but apparently you did. <laughs> yeah. But what Jesus is actually saying is is very true that they divided the daylight into twelve equal portions. Hmm. So 
you're right. They had not invented the Apple Watch yet, so they didn't know the exact second they were on in the day, but it was customary for them to divide the day into 12 equal sections. And it's very easy to do this. When the sun is in the middle of the sky, it's noon. And so you right. kind of count from the sunrise is 6 a.m. And you have so you have six hours from sunrise to, to noon, and then you have six hours from noon till the sun sets. And you just divide the day that way. It's not that hard. And that's what ancient people did. Um, as a matter of fact, that's kind of what we're doing, although we've invented artificial lights so we don't have to depend on the sun anymore. But that's still kind of the basis of our time. So what we're saying is there is no good evidence for the word day to mean billions of years. Or thousands. Or, or even whatever, thousands. Or, or an entire it, age or whatever it is you want to do. So why would we say that? Well, read the rest of Genesis. We're reading it with integrity. We're reading the book as it would have been received by the people who received it. And then we'll get to the next principle then, the coherence principle, which is we're going to read scripture and let scripture interpret scripture. Hmm. So what this means is scripture is a united whole. Even though it's made up of lots of parts and those parts might differ in genre, style, even language definitely differ in time, meaning some books were written thousand years BC, some are written a hundred years AD, right? So they have a large okay. span of time that they're written. And that's why they're written in different languages, because Hebrew was the dominant language of the Israelites when the Old Testament was written, some in Aramaic, not much. And then Greek was the language of the New Testament was written in. So they're actually written in different languages. But sure. Even with all those differences, there's a coherent whole because this is the story that God has revealed to us of his definitive act to save mankind in Christ Jesus. And so there's a coherence to this story. So as you read texts with integrity within their unique and original setting, we also read these texts looking to the whole to help us understand how to interpret them. So, so what does the whole have to say about a, a day? Right, so how does the creation? whole interpret day? And so we look at something like Exodus 20, where it says, just as the Lord created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, so also you should establish your week, right? And so all of a sudden we have mm -hmm. this pretty clear understanding that, that the day in Genesis is understood in Exodus, which by the way, same author, right? Moses wrote both books. Yeah. It is interpreted as a day there, something that you and I would, would readily identify as 24 hours, or like we said in the ancient world, the cycle of the sun going up and down, right? Rising yeah. and setting, which I know, Earth rotating and Copernican universe, <laughs> that's fine. It, again, don't worry about these kind of things. Um, we still use metaphors like sun going up and down ourselves. Yeah. So that's not we denying the scientific and reality. Sunrise of, and of, sunset right. is still how we define everything. It's still, and we'll say, oh, the sun is, the sun's, you know, really bright today. Well, the sun's not actually changing its brightness based on the day, right? That's just our <laughs> perception and how we talk about it. And that's fine. Again, yeah. we're, not, we're not being that particular where we're like, we can't talk using common language. And that's actually the point is that the Bible uses common language. It's not written in code. Now, you hear me say that over and over and over. I just want to pause briefly to explain this, that in the history of Bible interpretation, there has been some teachings that the Bible was written in Holy Spirit code, hmm. meaning it's unintelligible to the average human you have to have the Holy Spirit to even understand the words themselves. Oh, interesting. There are even people who call the Greek of the New Testament Holy Spirit Greek. Yeah, as if it's a fundamentally different Greek than any other kind of Greek. Right, and they're scandalized when we can actually prove how classical Greek led to this Koine Greek and how we can see the development within the Greek language and we can even see the authors using Atticisms and you know all kinds of Greek technology. They want to say it's more like dwarves where they just sprung up out of the ground? Well, the language did. The language just right. was only used for the, for the New Testament or something, and it's unintelligible outside of the New Testament, which is just... It's impossible. It, there, you can't have that point of view and actually read the Bible. It doesn't work, 
right? It simply doesn't work. Do they do work. that with the Hebrew then too? Well, they say that they're going to do that with the Greek. A lot of people say that Hebrew is actually God's language, and that's why they needed this Holy Spirit Greek because all other languages are corrupt oh, after the. So Tower it actually of Babel. draws from Hebrew being a yeah. special language. Therefore, this Greek must yeah. be also and interesting. And okay. what we would say to that is is that God certainly chose to reveal His Word to us in Hebrew and Greek, and we should thank Him for that, and we should and rejoice some Aramaic. in that, and a little bit of Aramaic here and there. Yeah. And and even some Egyptian loan words and you know Phoenician loan words and those kind of things that happens. That's because that's the way humans use language. Yeah. So we we rejoice in that. We don't reject that. We don't deny that. So as a matter of fact, some of us actually learn those original languages so we can read the the Bible as as close to the original as we can. But on the other hand we affirm that those were actual languages that people understood. And that's the point of seeing this with integrity is that it, it actually means what the words say and the way to interpret these texts on a larger scale than just the individual context themselves is that we believe the overall arc of the scriptures, God's action to save his people through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is actually a principle that interprets the entire story. So scripture interprets scripture. When you say, well, I found this verse over here that says that, we don't just say, oh, the Bible says it, therefore it must be true. We say, does that pa- how does that passage fit into the entire narrative of scripture? How does that passage fit into the entire interpretation of scripture? How does scripture interpret itself? So real quickly, Ephesians 2.10, this is a verse a lot of people like to quote, Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works with God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And they say, see, it's about good works. And we say that passage is in the Bible and that's true. But that passage is not about justification. It's not a passage that defines how we are saved. Right. That's yeah. actually a passage that talks about the result of us being saved. And they say, well, why would you say that? And we say, because well, the context of scripture tells us that. Okay? Saved isn't even the verb in that verse. It's the verb a couple of verses earlier. See, and that's one's easy because you just go to the previous two verses and it talks about, for it is by grace you have been saved by faith apart from works. <laughs> right? This is a gift yeah. of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So God's not going to say you're saved apart from works and then say you're saved by works. That that doesn't make sense in the whole. So that what do we say is... the integrity principle then because you're, you're not treating scripture as if it's written with integrity. And, right. And so it actually yeah. logically flows and those kind of things. And it violates the overall message of scripture, which is that God saves through his actions... And those actions he tells us about in promises, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to say this is the overall narrative of Scripture. From Genesis on to Revelation, God promises to save his people without their help. He's just going to save them. So you've you've made a move here real quick, and you've used a word that we haven't used a lot yet in this this series, but I think it's an important one, uh, the word context. And I want us I want us to just pause there for a little bit because in in a lot of other uh, Lutheran podcasts and and blogs and sermons you'll you'll hear that the the key to understanding scripture there are three rules context 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 now we're not saying that that's wrong but I'm starting to wonder if if taking hermeneutics and kind of defining it in that way context 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 is kind of like a shortcut. To what we're talking about here, these this three principles: the Christological, the integrity, the coherence principle. Is is this call for context, 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 kind of shorthand for what we're we're doing right now? Because what you've just gone through, I'm thinking, oh well, that's what I was taught was basically context, context, context. It is. We're we're kind of filling in the gaps. That's aren't exactly we? right. So the first okay. context, think Christ. The second context, think integrity of the text itself in its original setting. The third context, think coherence. Okay. So context, 
What's the context? God's definitive action to save mankind in Christ Jesus. That's the overall context. The next context, I'm going to read this text as though it has clear meaning, right? I'm not, it's not code words. It has clear meaning. Third context, this is part of an entire united narrative. So I cannot interpret a passage that contradicts the entire narrative of scripture. I can't do that because scripture interprets scripture. So the first context, Christ. The second context, integrity. How does the, 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 the clear meaning of scripture, right? So, so mm-hmm. read the book, read the book, like read Genesis, read Exodus, read Jonah, read whatever, and say, this verse is going to make sense within this book as it was written to the original hearers. And it's not using some kind of Holy Spirit code language. Now there are yeah. symbols and metaphors, but those symbols and metaphors are comprehensible to readers. That's that's the first example I thought of earlier in this episode when you mentioned there there's it's not a code or it's not like secret information. I was like, well, Revelation is kind of weird. It starts right off with the the seven lampstands and the seven angels, but it also says right there, and these lampstands are right. And so and we're so told it, it right away. It gives you the key. So it, it's remember it's code, Revelation but, is like a big signpost saying beware symbolism ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's how the book starts, right? It's like okay, just buckle your your straps up here because it's going to be a bumpy ride because you are about to jump into a bunch of symbolism, some of which we're going to explain, and some of which we're going to leave, hmm. and just leave it alone. And so there are parts of scripture that are hard to understand as far as understanding the symbol, but the words themselves are not weird words. They're normal words. Okay. Okay. And we learned to define them through linguistics, through the usage of words and context and how the author uses words. So, I mean, think about this. The Psalms are pretty much a whole book of symbolism. But no one freaks out about it. As a matter of fact, right. we love the Psalms. The <laughs> it's, Lord it's is my shepherd. Favorite, yeah. And you go, wait, what? So God is a shepherd. What does that I'm make a me? Sheep? A sheep. And then what do we do? We preach on the qualities of sheep and how wonderful this is as a metaphor. And we say, oh, everybody understands the metaphor of shepherd and sheep. Well, this makes less sense. and less I, now because yeah. we're not as agrarian as we used to be. But we right. didn't. What I, I we usually do? We eat explain sheep. It. I don't take care of them. Yeah, and that's exactly right. You just said it. Take care of them. So we say at some point we understand the metaphor of taking care of, and we say, okay, mm. how is God a shepherd, and how am I a sheep? Right. And and what do we do? We're reading it taking very seriously that this was an intentional metaphor by the author using words we understand. And that metaphor actually serves the context of the Psalm. It serves the context of Israel at that time. It Mm -hmm. serves within the context of scripture itself. As a matter of fact, we might even look for other places in the Bible where this metaphor is used again. Now we hear, we will just wait. We hear Ezekiel talking about the path, the, the, the prophets and the and the what we would call pastors of Israel being called shepherds. And then we hear Jesus in John chapter 10 saying, I am the good shepherd. And we go, whoa, whoa, there's a bunch of shepherd metaphor going on here. And so what we do is we're interpreting it within the Psalm, but we're also interpreting it in, in the context of the larger narrative of scripture itself. Mm-hmm. And then we ask, is is it does it make sense for us to say Yahweh is the shepherd of God's people. And then Jesus is the shepherd of God's people. What's the connection here? And right away, what do you see is the Christological principle that over that it hangs over all of this, right? And we say, oh, mm-hmm. what David is saying in Psalm 23 is actually a confession that we would make as well, that Jesus is the definitive action of God to save mankind. And guess what? When I have Jesus, what else do I need? Hmm. right and and we look through the psalm and then we say oh even though i am the valley of shadow of death i don't fear evil because you're with me and then we hear matthew 28 right lo i am with you to the end of the age and we're going wait a minute see this 
this isn't a text that makes no sense. This is a text that that we can read it with integrity in its original setting. We can read we can let scripture interpret scripture and we see how this clearly and simply points us to Christ. And this this is one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons your pastor when he's preaching on Sunday morning will use an illustration mm-hmm. because some of these these metaphors and the way scripture speaks we have gotten contextually removed from them because right. I'm not a shepherd. I don't know any shepherds. I'm not hanging out with sheep on a regular basis. My pastor might try and find some contemporary example that I can relate to and use that to say, okay, you understand what that means. Mm-hmm. That means the same thing as as shepherd. Over right. Here. It's this parallel is to, the, to the I'm metaphor. Gonna, I'm going to use that. So pastors, when they're preaching, they actually, a lot of the time in their sermon, this is what they're doing is they're applying these hermeneutic principles to the text and then passing it along to you. And that's uh, that's what a, one, one of the things a good sermon's gonna do is show the, the Christological focus, show the integrity, show the coherence of the text that he's preaching on. This is why if you're on a, a lectionary kind of a, a series as well, if you're following the lectionary, they might pull in the epistle and the Old Testament and the gospel and say, look, here's how these all fit together because mm-hmm. they're doing this. Mm-hmm. That's right, um, It's it is one text. Yeah, We do believe, and we'll say this again, we said it last episode, we'll say it again. We do believe in the inspiration of Scripture. We do believe oh, yeah. in the inerrancy of Scripture. We do confess that this is God's Word. And, yep. and therefore, we do believe that there is one divine author of Scripture, even as he worked through various human authors to write these words. So... That's one of the reasons we can say without any hesitation that this is a united whole because yeah. it is all inspired by the same Holy Spirit, right? Yep. So he's not going to all of a sudden change his mind in the middle or something or, or go a different direction. This is, we, we fully confess without any reservation the inspiration and inerrancy of Holy Scripture. And that's one of the reasons that we can say that that we read this and let scripture interpret scripture we read this and believe the holy spirit inspired normal humans to use normal words just like he does today like peter just said when your pastor preaches you didn't have to learn a new language to go to church your pastor is a human speaking for us english right and in english that we can understand and we believe that that's good that that god works through that uh, we we spend lots of time, we meaning biblical scholars, spend lots of time trying to translate scripture into language that people can read it in. I know Peter has, has worked with, with Bible translation in the past, and mm-hmm. we spend lots of energy and time trying to get the Bible into languages that people can read and hear and understand. Be, and that's all based on this idea that God revealed his word to us in a way that is plain, that is simple. And again, simple doesn't mean not complicated. Simple <laughs> means that the words themselves are not foreign. They're not made up words that have no meaning in English, in reality. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Right. Exactly. We're not just that's, making that's, up words because it sounds good in, in a there. song. You know, we're, <laughs> these are like, like Psalm 23, the example we used. None of those words are complicated. The Lord is my shepherd. Your five-year-old can learn those words. They're not words that have no meaning. They're very simple words. Yeah. And yet in those simple words, God is communicating to us an eternally important spiritual truth. And the way we interpret that truth is not to say, therefore I need to go become a sheep. <laughs> See, that doesn't make sense. We, we would laugh, all right, you laugh at that. But that would be a literal interpretation that, that takes that text out of context, that takes it out of the context of the psalm, but also out of the context of the whole narrative of scripture. Well, I, I'm also willing to bet that at some point in history, somebody, I, I keep thinking probably most likely a monk, decided that they were actually gonna go try and live as a sheep oh, for yeah. a while in order to understand and, and do this because they thought, I, this is how I'm going to understand this. I'm going to go actually live like a sheep for a certain amount of time and fully immerse myself in that so I can 
Get it. So we're at the end of this episode, but one of the, ep- and not next one, I think we're going to do something else first. But but as we go in this, in this series, we're going to start talking about how then do we interpret different kinds of texts within scripture? How do we interpret metaphor? How do we interpret prophetic text? How do we interpret narrative text? How do we interpret parables? How do we yeah. interpret Paul's letters? How do we interpret apocalyptic literature that is rich with symbolism? How do we interpret these things? What do we do when we don't understand scripture? These are all yeah. questions that we are going to address, but what we're trying to give you is some some real simple things to remember as you read. And one last okay. thing laying, before- Laying the foundation, if you will. Yes. Yeah. And one thing I just want to bring up, and we'll get to this a lot as we go forward, is I also have one. Is thing. you'll notice that the interpretation of Psalm twenty-three is not about me; it's about Jesus, and I. Hmm. That is the overall thing that we want everyone to hear as we go through this: is that the basic hermeneutical principle is that the Bible is about God's action in Christ not about you. Mm. So when you interpret the Bible, don't read it as God's love letter to you or an instruction book for you. Those are actually hermeneutics that right. are different than what we're talking about. Exactly. Those are competing Instead, read it as God's book about what he has done in Christ to save. So re- really quick, it's it's along the same lines. We've we've talked about the Christological principle being the primary one, and yesterday you showed me a diagram where you have the Christological principle here, kind of in the middle, and these two other principles are almost like moons mm-hmm. orbiting around right. it. Uh, because I, I think one thing that I found really helpful as we're thinking through is, if we're going to say the Christological principle is is the primary one where the integrity and coherence principles come into play is if you lose the integrity principle, it, it's not just that you're you're missing the integrity principle, you're actually going to impact your Christology. So if right. you begin, let's take Genesis. If you take Genesis and say, we're going to throw out the integrity principle, we're going to read this as a metaphor, as not actually what what happened it's not an actual account we're going to allegorize it we're going to make it life lessons for today it, that that's a problem in and of itself but it's an even bigger problem because you actually then impact your christology and who jesus is and how he defines himself and how he reveals himself because if genesis is pointing to christ and you're going to take genesis throughout the integrity principle or the coherence principle, either one, it doesn't matter. Say Genesis is just this separate thing off on its own, it's weird, doesn't fit the rest of scripture. You're actually causing damage to the Christological principle, to who Christ is, who he has revealed himself to be. And so that I find it helpful if I'm trying to figure out, okay, how am I missing the integrity principle? How am I messing up the coherence principle? If I go back and say, have I done something to Jesus? Mm-hmm. in this that changes who he has revealed himself to be, that changes what he has revealed himself to have done, uh, you know, all the, his character, who he is, the Trinity. Ha- have I messed that up in some way? And if I have, well, it could be I just straight messed up my Christology, but it's also that I might have messed up the integrity principle or the coherence principle somewhere else as I'm going through that verse. So I think I just wanted to bring that up because we're going to actually focus on that a lot through this series and say, hey, this, okay, that's nice, but you messed up Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) At the end of that, Jesus is somebody else. So let's go back and look and see what we did wrong in understanding this. And maybe it was the Christological principle, but it might have actually been one of the other two that we messed up. And then they messed up Jesus. And and either Jesus is someone else or Jesus is not God's definitive action. Yeah. Maybe he's, he, he's he's just a helper. Right. Maybe he's you know. part of the plan, but not the whole thing. And we kind of go, well, that's a mistake. That that does not fit with the overall narrative of Scripture. And that's that's exactly right. So as we've said before, and, and we'll keep saying it, is that if you want to check your theology, if you want to check your hermeneutics, if you want to check if you're, if you're thinking correctly, get it to the cross. 
crucify yeah. your thinking, right? Run to the cross and say, does this point me to what God has done in Christ to save? That's the important move. And that's the crucial conversation. Thank you guys for joining us today, for being a part of this series and, and joining us as we go through this. Our next episode, we're going to talk about what is the Bible, like this this book that we have in front of us. What is it? Which is, sounds kind of funny, but there's going to be some really good discussions coming out of that. So thank you all for joining us. You know how to send in your questions. You know how to support us. And you know how to find us on social media. So you guys have a great day. See ya.